All right, everyone. Um, we're going to start with our the daily restaurant show. I am I'm almost speechless in a sense of who we have on our show next. And you know what? One of the most incredible individuals we're going to be talking to here in a second on our show today. And I'm going to, you know, first of all, I'm going to tell you who it is because I've been trying to keep it a secret, but I can't. It's Chip Close. He's the host of the Restaurant Strategy Podcast. Plus, he's a coach, a restaurant coach. Like, that's re- that let alone makes you just want to listen to this whole podcast over and over again. You'll binge listen to this podcast, I'm sure, a few times. But he just released a book, and I'm going to show this for our YouTube channel, um, The Restaurant Marketing Mindset. This is This is what I believe in every day is the mindset around marketing your business out and your brand out. And we get to a guy, we get to talk to Chip, sorry. We get to talk to Chip on this topic here in a second. And I'm blown away by this. I'm shaking, I'm maybe too much coffee. I don't know what it is, but anyways, we're going to come back with uh, Chip Close here in a second. Uh, say, you don't want to skip this podcast. You really don't. This is going to be good stuff. Anyways, we're back. Chip, welcome back. What's going on? I'm glad to be here. Well, first of all, first, thank you for the book. Uh, I like your signature, by the way. I got a signed copy. <laughs> Must be kind of cool signing books. It, it's uh, it's weird. I wasn't going to do it, and then everyone <laughs> yelled at me and said I had to do it. So here's the cool part, right? Is that if you go third party and you order it from Amazon or Barnes & Noble, or whatever, you can get the book. Or you can order it from me from our website and you get a signed copy of the book. And if I ever become famous, which I hope is never the case, um, that will be worth something. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, you know, first of all, we've been dying to have you on our show for, for quite some time as I started to learn about who you are and what you do for our industry. And then you tell me you have a book coming out. And I'm like, oh, boy, we definitely have, you, have to have you on the show. What I'm going to ask you some questions on this before we yeah. get into a lot about the industry. What really? What was the trigger? What caused you to write this amazing book? Yeah, you know, it's uh, the same thing that really got me to start my podcast. So, the Restaurant Strategy Podcast was launched about four and a half years ago. Uh, it was five years ago when I started coming up with it, and at the time, I was doing a lot of consulting for restaurants. And I found um, I was having the same conversations with operators over and over and over again. Specifically, I basically ran an uh, an agency in New York City that did uh, marketing for restaurants, specifically independent uh, owners and operators. And I had these same conversations. And so I just thought, if I'm having the same conversations with these people, I'm guessing it's that way all over, which has largely proven to be the case. So I started the podcast to say, hey, let me give people a base of knowledge, a foundation of knowledge. It's called restaurant strategy, not restaurant tactics. Tactics change all the time, but strategies stay the same. And really, it has to do with the mindset, the, the frame of mind that I think you need to get into. This book is really just an extension of that. And what I wanted to distill down, because there's a lot we talk about on the podcast. There's a lot I cover when I coach with clients. But specifically, I wanted to just focus on the marketing stuff and said, okay, if there's a series of mindset shifts that are required, right? The first one being, yes, you can market. Yes, you have to market, right? If there are a series of mindset shifts that I think people have to go through to be able to do it and do it really well, then let's just distill it all down in like a power packed 200 page book that I know people will read and get a ton of value from. So that's where it came from. It came from having this conversation over and over and over again, right? I would say to somebody, hey, tell me about your marketing. And they would say, oh, they tell me one of two things. <laughs> they would say either number one, well, we don't do marketing. We're just, a, we're just a small restaurant. We're not some big company. We can't afford marketing. Or they would tell me the other thing, which is that they'd start telling me all about their social media. They say, well, we do two stories a day. We post four times to Facebook. We do et cetera, et cetera. And social media is not marketing. Um, I think we can agree <laughs> on that. And I, we, we can agree on the opposite, which is that if you sell something to other human beings, you have to market. You have to figure out which human beings and how you convince those human beings. That's as simple as it comes. And that's really where I start the book of saying, let's just on the, on the, on the bare minimum, uh, let's come up with a foundational piece and say, hey, we're trying to serve people. We're trying to sell people things. Let's figure out who needs the things and how we convince them to buy the things. That's really what a great marketer does. 
you know, I, I love the fact that he also included assignments. <laughs> yeah. I love that because I find most operators that I've worked with and, and uh, I wish I, I could take the title of coach, but I won't yet. Um, but a lot of the times I would, I would, uh, I would send off a customer or a client away. And the next year I'd see them again and they'd be like, Oh, did you, you know, how did that go? Oh, were we supposed to implement? And they never did. Do you yep. find that happening a lot where restaurants just, That's they they love the advice and then they leave. Here's the and thing I find. Here's the thing I find all the time, especially when I go take the stage. So I'll go to trade shows, conferences, conventions, and I speak from the stage. And I would say, uh, "Hey, you, um, uh, you know, this is what I think you should do." And everyone just sort of nods in agreement. Yeah, and yeah. so true. Yeah, and and really, what it comes down to is that it's not enough to just nod in agreement. So when I decided to write this book, and I asked my publisher, I said, "This is what I'd like to do." so that it stays actionable, so that people feel like they can read a chapter. And for those of you who haven't seen the book yet, and again, it's called The Restaurant Marketing Mindset. Every chapter ends with an assignment, literally chapter one, assignment one, chapter two, assignment yeah. two. There's a cool workbook that we've put together. You can go and download for free as well as you're reading along. The idea is you read something, it goes, whoa, okay, I never thought of it that way. Inevitably, you're then going to say, so what do I do with that? How do I implement that into my business? And rather than just reading a 200 page book and going, wow, I'm smarter because of it. I want you to end that and say, wow, I'm smarter because of this. And my business is better off because I'm taking action as I go along. And if you do that, which I just don't see books doing that, I think it'll, I think it'll change. I think it'll change your business. That's the coach in me. Yeah. We've got to provide accountability. You do. And I really love that fact because a lot of restaurants, they, they, like you said, they nod. <laughs> and they say, yeah, we yeah. got it. And then they go and they're dealing with, a, you know, their staff or their food, something in their business the next day or that afternoon. And they forget everything you said, or yep. they just put it to the side and they never implemented. I think all books like this in our industry should have assignments like you've created here. Chip. I think I just, and you know what it was when I saw Atomic Habits. So James Clear wrote this great book, Atomic Habits. If anybody out there has not read it, it's it's absolutely worth uh, the time it has uh, direct applications to what we do in our industry, but I saw him and he basically did this and he was doing sort of like ways for you to keep pace with it and to put a lot of the stuff into practice at the end of every chapter. I was like, well, if that guy can do it. I'm definitely going to do it. And so I, then I just came to the publisher and luckily they loved it. They said, no, 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 we, we, we love this, this aspect of it. It's one of the things that we love most about the book. So, uh, that's where we're it. at. I love it. Well, the one thing, there's a couple things in the book. I didn't get a chance to read through all of it, but there's a couple points I really want to talk a little bit more about with you. I think it's, first of all, there's so much in here. Um, there's only a few books that I get a chance to really dive into, and they have that mindset included in a lot of the topics, shifting the mindset. And you, you bring that up a lot through your book here. What do you find a lot of operators, do they shift that mindset or do they just stick into the mindset they are today? And why is the, that important to shift that mindset? It's it's back to from where, where we started this conversation, right? Is that a lot of owners and operators, and understandably, they feel like they've got to wear all these hats, right? They are the chef, they are HR, they are payroll, they are marketing. To ask them to become a professional at digital marketing or social media or SEO, uh, I hate having to do it, but if you're going to run your small business, you you really have to. And, and if you're not going to take the time to do that, a lot of the mindset shifts just are getting to show you it, it's just a five degree shift, right? It's just, it, it's awesome. not, it's not any harder than what you're doing. It's just different. And I understand that different can be hard. The clients I work with specifically come to me to be shown a different way of doing things, really a different wow. way of thinking about things. So I just, by extension, that's that comes out in my talks, it comes out in the podcast, and I made it a real key point in the book. The idea being that it's 24 chapters over four different sections, and there are, I don't know, 25 or 30 different mindset shifts I invite you to take. And by the end, I somebody said this one time, you're going forward, right? The ship is facing forward. But if you take a little bit of a shift and a little bit of a shift and a little bit of a shift and a little bit of a shift, you go all the way around and you're basically doing a big 360 
And ultimately, at the end of this book, I hope everyone is facing the same direction they started, except what you have is perspective because you took a look all the way around. The, the, the little shift, the little shift, the little shift, the little shift. You ended up looking at everything around you. So when you decided to go forward again, you have greater perspective. It's one of the things that comes out of coaching, right? What do you get from coaching? You get insight, you get perspective, and you get accountability. So that's sort of baked into this book, this idea of, okay, how can I change your perspective? How can I give you greater insights after 24 years in the industry and all these years uh, marketing restaurants? And how can I provide some accountability? I answered those questions the way I did in this book, and and hopefully people read the book and they feel like it's di directly applicable to what they do. Yeah, and that's the best, right? Is applying it. We see that. I see that a lot with a lot of data that comes out, and it, these these companies create these beautiful data packages or presentations. And I sit there and I'm like, but what do we do next? <laughs> yeah. What's the next step? Like, tell me. That's great that the graph is going up or down, but what do I do as an operator? Yep. that I uh, can improve my business based on the information you're providing. The one chapter I want to get into this because I think this is perfect and I love it. B is for brand. You got to, okay, this is chapter three. You have to tell me more about this because restaurants, I'm doing a lecture actually next week on this topic for restaurants on the importance of building your brand. Can you tell me a little, because you got Sean yeah. Walsh on here a few times and there might've been a little bit of an influence maybe from Sean on there. But uh, you got to tell me more about this, Chip. So early in the book, so the book is split up in, into four different parts, right? And the first part is really focused. It, it provides the foundation. So chapter three is part of this opening of the book. We start the book by defining marketing, right? What is marketing? It's a question I ask all the time. It's a question I, I was asked all the time, and I, and I never got a satisfying answer, so I came up with my answer. We start with that. And then what I do is in the chapters after that, we lay out this framework called the ABCDs of marketing. ABCD stands for audience, brand, competition, and differentiation. The framework loosely says, or it's a, it's a framework for thinking about how to position yourself in a market, right? In a market that has other restaurants, other, other options that consumers can go to. But A is audience, right? So we say, okay, who has a problem that needs to be solved? B, our brand is the solution to the problem, right? So our restaurant, the experience we're crafting is the solution. And then we go to C, competition. We figure out who else is trying to solve the same problem we are. And then D, differentiation. Since we've got competitors, we're naturally in a category. So we say, how do we separate ourselves from the competitors? Meaning if somebody says, I'm in the mood for sushi tonight, there's then a short list in their mind of five, six, eight restaurants that they could go to for sushi. How do you become top of mind so that people choose you instead of anyone else? So the ABCD framework is a way of thinking about how you stand out in your market. And B, brand, is the experience you're crafting. It's what we talk about in that chapter. We say, you know, we're not serving food because if somebody just needed to eat, if, if sustenance was all they cared about and we need food to sustain ourselves, we could do that for cheaper than we could at any of the restaurants that we own, right? We could go to the supermarket, get, you know, chicken, rice, and a, and a can of beans, feed a family of four for, I'm guessing, less than $15, right? We can't do that at any of our restaurants. So let's say, let's agree that we're not just trying to keep people alive in our restaurants. Yeah. We're trying to provide something else, and we're, we're providing an experience. There's some other reason why people go out to eat. I talk about this all the time. Uh, it makes its way a little bit into this book. But I always say, let's not fool ourselves. Dining out is a luxury. It's a luxury that none of us need. A hundred years ago, no one dined out, certainly in the way that we do now. Meaning we paid someone to come up with a recipe, go shop for the ingredients, prep, cook, serve, clear it away, and clean up after us later. If that's not luxury, that's a luxury that people, are, most individuals 100 years ago did not know. And we have to acknowledge that, that, that what we offer is, um, is special, is unique. It is unnecessary. It is, I don't want to say frivolous, but it, it is, it, it's an indulgence. So now we take this back to this idea of brand, right? Brand for me is every touch point you have with a consumer. It is the experience you provide, the answer to someone's problem. 
You have to look at the at your market and you have to say, who has a problem that I'm uniquely qualified to solve? What is the solution then I'm going to craft? You begin with that sense of empathy or you'll fail or you'll you'll fail uh, if you if you leave it out. If you're just trying to create something, you're going to spend all your days trying to find customers. If you have the so solution to someone's problem, if you're the answer to someone's prayers, someone will say, oh, my God, this is everything I've been waiting for. This is the thing I've been looking for. How important is the building the personal brand of the individual in the in the restaurant? So we talk about that a lot in the D chapter, right? So A, B, C, D, audience, brand, um, competition, right? And then um, differentiation. Differentiation, I would say you have to stand out. There has to be a reason why someone would choose you over something else. Again, we get we get into this a little bit later in the book. We talk about this difference between a commodity product and a luxury product, right? Too often, I think restaurants fail because we think of ourselves as a commodity. It becomes a race to the bottom. A commodity good is a good where all things being equal, the consumer will make their decision based on one of three criteria, right? Convenience, familiarity, or price. That's gasoline. Gasoline. If I'm running out of gas on the highway, I no. don't care. I have no loyalty. I am loyal to the next place I see so that I don't run out of gas. If I'm at an intersection with three options, three different gas stations, I'm going to pick, guess what? The one with the cheapest prices, right? That's the same way with eggs or milk or flour for most consumers. And for most consumers of restaurants, if you don't give me a compelling reason to come to this one over that one, I'm going to go to the one that's easiest, the one that's most convenient, or the one that's cheapest. So when you talk about personal brand and then the restaurant's brand, one of the questions that I ask the readers in the book is, and I, and I ask all my clients, when we talk about differentiation, I say, answer this question. What are the stories only you can tell? Because if you're just a sushi restaurant and you got spicy tuna and a rainbow roll and a dragon roll, who cares? Everybody, every sushi restaurant I've ever been to has got a, a spicy tuna roll, a rainbow roll, a dragon roll. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why would I why would I go here? And I think we have to continue to answer that question. We can answer that question in a bunch of different ways. Our personal stories, our personal why can have a lot to do with that. Um, should have a lot to do with that and how we um, how we convince people. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. We're convincing people. We talk about this idea of value proposition. It's a super academic, very marketing-y term that I, I try not to do a lot of this in the book. This idea of value proposition is simply this. Why does a consumer pick one over the other? There is some reason why they pick one over the other. Either it's a lower price, it's easier to get to, it's more convenient. It's familiar. It's the one their mom always bought. It's the place they've been going to forever. There's some reason why they make a decision or because mm -hmm. it's new, because it's fancy, it got a good review. There's a million ways to answer that question. And I find that most restaurants don't even try to answer the question. So in the book, I challenge you to write 10, 20, 30 different stories that only you can tell. Meaning we're the only sub shop in this shopping center. This is the only restaurant owned by me. You know, this is, we're the only place that has this or that, or we bake our bread this way or whatever, whatever it is. There are stories that you can tell and like farm to table is not a, is not a unique story anymore. Or we use locally sourced ingredients. Yeah. Like, great. You should. <laughs> There's something else, right? There's something else there. And there should be 10, 20, 30 something else's. The personal brand is just part of that for sure. For sure. Oh, Chip, Chip, we 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 drink the same Kool-Aid, I'll tell you about. I used to say that with menus where people put like fresh. Oh, we have fresh items. I'm like, well, I hope. <laughs> you don't sell we have frozen items. Yeah. Usually it doesn't help. Right. Yeah. So that that is phenomenal. That's so it's such great advice. It's so important, I think, as we move forward, because I, I, I have always had this is this is my belief is people follow people with strong brands and believe in people with strong brands because they're pure and authentic in a way if you build that brand properly out. How important it is to be that that within your business is being authentic and real nowadays? You know, authenticity is a, a, a strange word. 
Seth Godin, right? Noted public speaker, best-selling author of like, I don't know, 23 books. He talks a lot about authenticity, right? The authentic sound. He uses, uh, he uses rock and roll bands as a, <laughs> as a great uh, testament to this. He's like, authenticity is BS. It is. He said, because somebody wrote this song 12 years ago when they were feeling something, they were thinking something and they wrote it down. That's when they were authentically in that place. But then when they play, you know, 100 concerts a year, 150 concerts a year, 12 years later, right? They are not in that same place and they have to manufacture the emotion, the feeling behind what they were feeling when they wrote that song, when they first sang that song. That's not authenticity. So we have to be, I think we have to, and when he said it, I was like, it really made sense. There's nothing authentic about being a, a server or a manager in a restaurant. There are some days we're having a crappy day. We yeah. really don't want to be in a great mood. We really don't want to be warm and generous. And we just sort of want to sit on our couch, right? Order Chinese food, watch yeah. an old movie. There are some days. I have those days. You have those days. And especially in hospitality, it, it bears mentioning here. So when we talk about authenticity, I think we've got to be really careful. A lot of what we do is manufactured. A lot of what I talk about in the book is figuring out ways to manufacture uh, uh, certain actions. How do we get someone to do something that we want them to do, right? So if we just say, oh, we're just going to be authentic. I mean, I think we should be warm and gracious and open. But again, there are some days we don't feel, we're not feeling it. We got to put it on. We got to fake it a little bit, right? And, and so that. that authenticity then... I think we have to then dig deeper and talk about what we're, what we're actually talking about. I think nobody really has an authentic, um, nobody gets an authentic experience because you'd get, you'd get somebody being grumpy. I, I don't feel like cooking today. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't feel like chopping all the onions and the herbs and everything. So you're just getting something really plain. I just sauteed this up with some, uh, some <laughs> butter because authentically that's where I'm at right now, which we don't, which we don't do. It's like, no man, you got to season the thing. Well, you know what? It's funny you say that, Chip. I think we have to call – now, is that – it's maybe a little off topic, but is that the same when it comes to leadership? I hear this all the time from podcasts and speakers out there being – as a leader, you have to be authentic. Is that the same kind of thing? Explain – so I want to stick on the authenticity thing a little okay, bit. Okay, okay, okay. Because I love this. Because this when we great. talk about authenticity on a day-to-day -day basis, I think it's BS. What I think you really are talking about, and this I think we are going to be in alignment on, okay. is that how can we make this restaurant a reflection of ourselves? We are all so different, right? If I sat down and just asked you a bunch of questions for an hour, I would have such a deeper appreciation for you and your journey, the way you were raised, the relationships you have, what you believe in, what you're passionate mm -hmm. about, what you're good at, what you're not good at. I would get a really full view of you as a person, right? They always say this, the more we get to know people, the more we break down our differences and our, and we, and we, it, you could get along with just about anybody in the world, right? So a restaurant, I think, has to be a reflection of the people who made it. The, the people who create it are creators, right? So the owners, the operators. And I think, and this we say in the book, this is on like page one of the book. We don't need just another restaurant. My goal in writing the book largely is to talk you out of opening a restaurant because we don't we don't need any more. We've got too many as it is. So if we can agree that we don't need just another restaurant, no matter how much you may want to open a restaurant, we don't need it. So if we mm -hmm. can agree on the fact that we don't need any more restaurants, all of our markets are saturated, and you still really want to do it, then you got to prove it to me. You got to prove it to yourself. You have to prove it to your market as to why this place should exist, right? This place should exist because you have to fill in the blank. That's where this idea of, I don't think it's authenticity, but reflection of uh, being intentional about what you're doing, that we shouldn't just open up a newer version of something we already have. It should be something that doesn't exist. It should be a, you know, we've already got a sushi place. We got 19 pizza places in my town. We've got a couple of Mexican places. Like if you're going to do it, say something new about it. And I think that's, we owe that to ourselves and we owe that to ultimately our customers that I think not enough restaurants are a true reflection 
and about who the owners are, what they believe, what they care about, um, what they like, their tastes, et cetera, et cetera. And that I think we can get better about doing. So if that, if that has that authenticity thing, like it's not authenticity to me though. It's something else. It's about <laughs> being intentional. It's about being focused, about being deliberate about the choices you make rather than just saying, we're going to open a sushi restaurant and we're, we're going to make sure we have spicy tuna and a rainbow roll and a dragon roll. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally, totally. Oh, bad, Chip, you're good. <laughs> I just because the information. We it's, 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 it's so true, though. So here's so a true. here's a great example. I've got a client. Uh, they run a place called Misfit Tacos. And man, the first six months of them being in business, they just, they second-guessed everything about their business. And their whole idea is that the taco is the vehicle, but there are no carnitas. The, there is no al pastor. There's, there's not... There's no typical Mexican flavors there, but there's all these other different flavors. So they've got, oh. uh, they've got a, you know, a banana waffle and Nutella taco. They've got a, a Jamaican jerk taco. They've got a, a, you know, a chicken Parmesan taco. It's all these, their place is called Misfit Tacos. They knew who they were. They said, we love tacos, but we want to use tacos as the vehicle for all these different flavors. And we just don't think you should have to sit down and order chicken Parmesan to get chicken Parmesan. We're going to do it in taco form. I think the concept is absolutely genius. And I think it just takes time for people to catch on. There's the disappointment of people walking in and saying, no, 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 I really want it carnitas. Got it. No, no, no Baja fish tacos here. No carnitas, no al pastor. And that's a failure, I think, from their marketing of saying, yeah. There's the the promise that you made didn't match up with the expectations they had. So people walking in the door didn't understand where they were walking into. They just saw tacos. They said, oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I want to go get tacos. So as long as we can get better about communicating that, and that place ultimately is a, a deep reflection of who they are, what they believe, and and sort of what they thought they could bring to their market. And I think, and I think what they're doing is phenomenal. But yeah, if there's that mismatch in expectations, then it's going to be hard to convince someone. I totally agree. So I have to get this because this, this last chapter, there's one chapter here, so many good chapters here. I want, I want you to add, I want you to, your couple points on this. I get excited here. Content is king. Now we talk about this when you're an influencer or you're creating or a content creator out there. How important is creating content? And when you say that, is that social? Or is that creating content in the different verticals that you may have out there as a business? How does this relate to our industry and content is king? We have to think of ourselves as a mini media company. Is that the only way? And to be clear, people 50 years ago, people 30 years ago would have died for the tools and the access that we now have. That we not only have all these platforms that we can own, that we can put stuff out onto, right? I mean, think back to a restaurant 30 years ago. 30, 35 years ago, they didn't have a website. A website is a place to put content, to talk about who you are, what you do, why it matters, where to go get it, when they can get it, right? All these things. Yeah. Google, your Google My Business page is a, is a resource that people 40 years ago would have died for. They would have died for. There are tools available uh, at our disposal. And if we don't take advantage of this, right? And you brought up Sean. He's the one, uh, he's yeah. one of the guys who gave a testimonial for my book. He believes this. This is something that we have uh, such alignment on. Um, if you're not taking advantage of the tools that are available to you in the year 2023, then, then you're missing something really huge. So the where, your website is a great opportunity, right? You can start a YouTube channel. You can start social platforms. So Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Twitter or now X, whatever you want to call it, right? These are all places that you can put out there. You could start a blog. You could start a podcast. I was going to ask you that. That was my next slide is yeah, because I did a show. I did a webinar actually that every restaurant should have a podcast. I, I, you will, I'm a convert. I, I wholeheartedly uh, believe in that. Now, they shouldn't have a podcast like I have a podcast, like you have a podcast. No, no. They exactly. have to come in and say, what do we have to say about it? Okay, we're entering the market and there's already 50 restaurant web uh, podcasts. Yeah. What, why do we need to exist? Same thing you have to answer, same question you have to answer when you're going to open a restaurant. Say, why do we need to exist? You have to define that. Um, 
I believe content is king because it's the best way for you to tell your story in whatever way you want on a consistent basis every single day. And you need a you need a system for that. You need a, a machine for doing that. Ultimately, if you just figure out a couple of quick things, how to do it, how to do it well, it um, doesn't matter. You, you don't necessarily have to do it all, but I think you should do as much as you possibly can uh, because we've never had these tools available to us before. You know, that if you take anything from this podcast today, I think that to me resonates so much is content is king. And I, I, I say the same thing in my lectures and my presentations as well, is that don't stop just because you're, you're hitting it. You're hitting a home run right now. Just continue to pump it out. There's too many other companies or other forces out there outside of our industry that's creating content that draws people. Because the, the consumption of content, I think, is limited. People can only so- consume so much. And Jay, here's the thing. This is what usually keeps people from doing it. They say, the biggest question, I say, hey, you should be, think of yourself as a mini media company, be putting out content all the time in as many different channels as possible. Inevitably, whether they say it out loud or not, their biggest question is, well, what am I going to talk about? That's a bigger problem than you having to talk about it. If you don't have anything to talk about, that's why you don't have enough customers. That's why your check average is low. That's it. No, 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 no. I mean it. I mean brilliant. It. That brilliant, you, And that's rarely the case. What happens is we've got a lot of humility on the part of our owners and operators. And that's great. What you do, and this is where I come from as a coach. I say, what you do is extraordinary. Not everyone could do it. And not everyone who tries does it well. You are doing it. You are doing it well. Let's simply talk about why you do what you do and what you're doing that's different, right? And when you do that, when I tell people, hey, you should be sending at least one email a week to your list, many weeks, sometimes two. When I say it, they go, well, what am I going to talk about? I don't know. Let's let's go to the calendar. Let's talk. What are we going to talk about this Tuesday? What are we going to talk about on Friday? What are we going to talk about next Wednesday? And when you start doing that, well, I could talk about the new dish I just put on. We could talk about the new fall cocktails we're starting to develop. Well, I could talk about the new um, chef de cuisine we just had started. Oh, I could talk about our new wine director. Oh, I could talk about, suddenly you start thinking about a lot that you can talk about because you're going to great effort to make sure that people have a great experience. You're hiring great people. You're, you're, you're doing menu development. You're just talk about that, right? Just talk about I, that. And I think when you do that, you realize that you're probably not talking about it right on your menu. Your servers aren't armed with the right things to talk about, nor your reservationists or your managers. You're all just too humble about it rather than saying, this is what we do. We're super passionate and excited about what we do. This is what we do. This is why we do it. This is why you should care. I bet you there's a correlation between not having labor <laughs> with that either. I bet you people that do that have no problem with labor. Yeah. You know, there's a restaurant here in uh, in New York City in Brooklyn. Uh, it's run by a guy named Greg Backstrom. Uh, the restaurant's called Olmsted. Uh, and Greg had worked at Alinea. Greg had, he's got this really crazy background. But this is a really low key, like neighborhood restaurant. Every menu item in the menu descriptions has what the item is, what the sides are, what the sauce is, what the process for cooking it, what the allergens are, all that, everything that a server sees on a menu description. And at the bottom of every menu card, it says, here's a couple of stories you can tell about it. This dish is a riff on a dish that Chef Backstrom had when he was in Vietnam. What he did was blah, blah, blah. This is a riff on a childhood dish that his mother used to make and blah, blah, everything. Or this dish comes, you know, we source this ingredient from this farm and we go up there once a week, uh, you know, for one week a year, every year, because we have a relationship, blah, blah, like there's a story and nothing goes on the menu without at least one story. And what happens is what the chef believes is they said, when somebody says, hey, can you tell me about the duck? They don't want to say, well, it's a duck breast from this, this, and it's smoked here and seared and blah, blah. They don't want the, they just want to understand, is it good? What's it like? And they say, so when somebody says, hey, can you tell me more about the duck? You say, yeah, great. The first thing out of your mouth should be, you know, this is a riff on a dish that Chef Backstrom had when he was in Vietnam. And so the flavors in the dish are blump, blump, blump. But most people don't know enough about cooking to really get into or geek out on the, the details of it. 
What they do know is, oh, the chef was traveling. Oh, the chef was inspired. Oh, the chef has brought some of that experience back here. And I got a little bit of that here in uh, here in Prospect Heights, Brooklyn. Like, that's what they want to know. Yeah. They don't want to know yeah. the ins and outs of, you know, how we make the sauce and the five spice. And they don't care. They want to know why it's on the menu, what it tastes like, why I should care about it. Yeah, it's that storytelling. And we believe in stories, right? We That's believe the in thing. Them. What are the stories only you can tell? Yeah, that's brilliant. Well, Chip, I know you're busy and you got to run here. But I, first of all, you're inspirational. <laughs> what you say, it's incredible. And big call out to this book again, The Re Restaurant Marketing Mindset. I tell you, it's like you you took my brain. Yeah. <laughs> <and> you, <laughs> you, you took what was in my brain and you put it on paper and you built it the way that I think every restaurateur and chef Hoteller needs to read. I'm just blown away by your book and I can't wait to dive into it more. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for spending time with me. It, it is an absolute pleasure to get to meet you and just to uh, do this podcast today with you. No, it's thank you. I appreciate it. Listen, we're what we do, what the industry does is so hard. And I think if we can just help people do it a little bit better, a little bit easier, a little bit more efficiently, effectively, that's why I have the podcast. That's why I wrote this book. And, and if it just helps people do what they do a little bit uh, eat more easily, then uh, we will have succeeded. Awesome. Unbelievable, Chip. It is a pleasure. And uh, have a great rest of your day. And thanks to everyone else to listen to our podcast today. Thanks, guys. Awesome. We'll see you later.